Excited Utterance, The Evidence and Proof Podcast, Episode Number 92, Louisa Heine, The Incomplete Rule of Completeness. Welcome to Excited Utterance. I'm your host, Ed Chang, from Vanderbilt Law School. Excited Utterance is your podcast for cutting-edge scholarship and developments in the world of evidence. We bring virtual workshops to you throughout the academic year. This week, our guest is Louisa Heine. Louisa is a professor at the University of Utah's S.J. Quinney School of Law, where she teaches evidence, legal writing for judicial clerks, and judicial process. Our podcast today features Louisa's new article, The Incomplete Rule of Completeness, which is co-authored with Emily Nuvon. In it, Louisa discusses the somewhat tense relationship between Federal Rule of Evidence 106 and the common law's rule of completeness. Rule 106 departed from the common law in a number of critical but ambiguous ways, leading courts to disagree on the continuing viability of the common law rule. My discussion with Louisa explores these differences between Rule 106 and the rule of completeness the relationship between the federal rules and the common law, and ultimately, what we should do about the split that has resulted among courts. Louisa, delighted to have you on Excited Utterance. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. Your article deals with the rule of completeness, both under the common law and as codified by the federal rules of evidence. To start us off, perhaps you could tell us in broad terms what the rule of completeness is and what the theory behind it is? So the rule of completeness in the federal rules of evidence is in Rule 106. In the rules as they're currently codified, the rule of completeness says that if one side offers part of a writing or a recorded statement, then the adverse party can at that exact time stop the proceedings and ask the court to introduce the other portion of the writing or the recorded statement if, in fairness, the jury should be allowed to hear both at the same time. So it's a way of preventing one side from taking statements out of context and leaving the jury with a really mistaken impression of what the evidence is. And just to be a little more concrete, can you give us an example of how the rule of completeness might work in action? Sure. I was just explaining this actually to my teenager last night. Let's pretend that we have a criminal defendant. Before he is charged, he is interrogated by a detective. And in that interrogation, our putative defendant says, I did it, but I did it in self-defense. When we are at trial, the prosecutor puts the detective on the stand and says, did the defendant confess? And the detective says, yes, he did. And the prosecutor says, what did the defendant say? And the detective says, he said, I did it. That statement is technically true. Our defendant said that. But by leaving out the second half of the statement, but I did it in self-defense, the prosecution is really leaving the jury with a mistaken impression about what that confession entailed. So the basic thrust of the rule, I think, seems sensible. It's a way of preventing distortion. And At least as far as I can tell, the rule doesn't seem to obviously favor one side or another in a litigation. So what's the downside of the rule? You suggest in the paper that the common law was concerned a lot about abuse. What kind of abuse occurred? So you're right. On the face of it, it's a really sensible rule. We don't want one side twisting the evidence by only letting the jury hear part of the evidence. The common law version of this applied to all statements that were made, whether they were oral or written or recorded. It also was a trumping rule. So a trumping rule means that under the rule of completeness, it didn't matter whether the statement was admissible or inadmissible. 106 came along and solved all admissibility problems. The difference, one difference at least, with the common law is that the rule of completeness was not a rule of timing. 
So the rule of completeness still required the adverse party to wait until the cross-examination in order to introduce the remainder or the related statements. But really, under the common law, it was almost automatic admission. If the statement counted as a remainder or related statement that in fairness should be considered, the statement was coming in. From the adverse party's point of view, the good news was under the common law, you had basically a rule of admissibility. It got you around things like the rule against hearsay. The downside was that you had to wait to use the rule. And as trial attorneys know, once something's in the jury's mind, if you have to wait a long time before correcting it, it can really solidify. And then you have a problem when you have to wait. Was there anything that the common law did to address the abuses? So the most important thing that the common law did was it limited the use of the completed statement. So the part that was the remainder or the related statement that the adverse party was admitting was only allowed to be used by the jury for context. But like the rule against hearsay, the jury was not allowed to use it for the truth of the matter asserted. Of course, again, as trial attorneys know, sometimes jurors have great difficulty separating one use from the other. But the proponent certainly got at least that limiting instruction. Were there limits on the number of statements you could use? Or really, you could use all of the additional statements in, say, a document or in a overall oral statement? Under the common law, it was a broader rule. So you would be able to include more than what we would allow today under Rule 106. So in some ways, the common law was narrower, and in some ways, it was broader. There was much less emphasis on fairness. There's a lot of emphasis on fairness under the codification of the rule. Yeah, so let's turn to Rule 106. As you describe, it didn't quite capture the common law in entirety. So what are the differences between the common law rule of completeness and the federal rule? There are three big differences. The first is that Rule 106 contains an acceleration clause. What that means is that the opponent, the party who's trying to introduce the remainder of the statement, does not need to wait until cross-examination to admit it. So it lets the opponent hit pause and ask the court at that time to introduce the rest of the statement. The second big difference is that it is limited to written and recorded statements. The common law applied to all statements, including oral statements. But the advisory committee said that it was limiting 106 to written and recorded statements for practical reasons. And then the third big difference is whether there was a trumping function. When I say trumping function, I mean that portion of the common law that allowed the proponent to introduce even otherwise inadmissible evidence. Rule 106 is silent on that point, and that has produced a massive split among both federal and state courts. So before we get to that, Let's go back to the limitation on written statements. Why did the advisory committee decide to leave out the oral statements? That's a great question. The advisory committee notes are fairly limited on that point. So we can read in a little bit. The notes of the advisory committee indicate that there were practical problems with allowing in oral statements. And you can imagine why that might be. If you had two parties, let's say in a contract dispute, who had had a number of conversations with each other, it might be difficult for someone on the stand to really be able to remember the exact details. So identifying what the remainder or related portion of the statement could be, in some contexts, really difficult. There are some other contexts where it would be fairly easy. So the example I gave you at the beginning with a criminal defendant who says, I did it, but it was self-defense, that's an easier example for oral statement. 
One big question that you raise in your paper is whether Rule 106 superseded the common law, which normally is how I would think about the federal rules. The whole point of the rules was to replace the common law. But you argue that the courts haven't really done that. How exactly have the courts interpreted this relationship between Rule 106 and the common law? And why haven't they simply followed the rule as written? So I'm going to answer that a little bit backward. The way that the rule is written, it seems to change two big areas. First, it excludes oral statements. And second, it gets rid of this trumping function. Both of those things become very problematic for a court that is trying to do what is fair. Fairness, of course, is included in 106, but also is included in Rule 102. So courts are trying to balance what juries hear with an eye towards fairness, but they're doing it in this very limited rule. There are a couple of ways, if you're a court who wants to get around 106, that you can get around it. And one of the ways you can do it is to say that Rule 106 partially includes the common law rule of completeness. There was also some language in Beach Aircraft, which is the only time that the Supreme Court addressed Rule 106. And in Beach Aircraft, the court talks about the rule being a partial codification of the common law. And that left some courts under the impression that really Rule 106 did not come in and completely subsume the common law as it was written. But this kind of complementary theory seems to me to defeat the purpose of the rules. I mean, if you supplement the common law, then you're not really codifying it and you're not really promoting uniformity. That's absolutely right. There are some states that have simply used the field code rather than adopting some version or even an identical version of the federal rules of evidence. So states that are using the field code have stuck with that common law version of the rule of completeness. But other jurisdictions that have adopted the federal rules of evidence have adopted the problems that come along with the current writing of Rule 106. So I guess the outcome of this dispute is that you end up with a number of splits on how to interpret Rule 106. And I think chief among them is the restriction on written statements and that admissibility or trumping function that you mentioned earlier. Can you talk a little bit about these controversies with respect to those rules? Sure. So the first controversy is whether Rule 106 should apply to oral statements in addition to written or recorded statements. In this case, courts that identify a fundamental unfairness in not including oral statements under 106 frequently use Rule 611 instead as a stand-in. So they treat 611 almost as a gloss on Rule 106 in order to expand it to oral statements. Perhaps the bigger controversy is on whether 106 has a trumping function, whether 106 allows in otherwise inadmissible evidence. That has created a massive split not only between circuits, but in some cases inside a single circuit. So we have states that are split as well as federal courts that are split. So I'd like to explore your views on these issues. First, do you think that Rule 106 actually supersedes the common law, both descriptively and normatively? That is, do you think the intent of Congress or of the original advisory committee was, to, in fact, to supersede the common law? And as a matter of first principles, should it supersede the common law? I think it's very problematic to treat federal rules of evidence as partial codifications only, where we end up then with a mishmash. We end up with the rules, which are designed to create uniformity, 
I like to tell my students that the whole point of the rule of law is that similarly situated parties are treated similarly. And when we combine pieces, sometimes pieces that we are choosing of the common law with pieces of the federal rules of evidence, much of that similarity goes away and it creates really a fundamental unfairness in a world in which we are trying to look for fundamental fairness. So did the advisory committee think it was superseding? It's always dangerous for me to try to look into the crystal ball and talk about what the advisory committee thought it was doing. But from my perspective, in general with the rules, yes, the idea is that the rules come along and they supersede the common law and create uniformity through all the federal courts. Okay, so let's turn to today. The advisory committee, I know, is actively looking at Rule 106. How should it come out on the issue of oral statements and the trumping function? So in the past, and this might go back to your prior question, part of the problem is that the advisory committee notes are fairly sparse on the issue of what the committee considered and why it chose to make specific changes from the common law. So to the degree to which the advisory committee decides to make those changes, more robust statements in the notes, or even more robust statements from the judiciary committees can be very helpful to courts in trying to interpret and also read the tea leaves on what Congress and the advisory committee intended. In terms of where the advisory committee should go, I think that they should do a couple of different things. First, I think that they should include oral statements, although I recognize that there's a problem there. As we were talking about, there are circumstances in which those oral statements have a high degree of reliability and some circumstances where they don't. So for example, if we go back to our detective who's talking to a suspect, and the suspect says, I did it, but it was self-defense, those statements might have been tape recorded or they might have been videotaped. And so there's a really high indicia of reliability. When we're talking about statements between private parties that sometimes happened years ago, perhaps that's not the kind of oral statement that we want to allow a court to use. 106 already talks about fairness. And so including oral statements where it would be unfair to exclude them is a way that the advisory committee could try to split that difference. Another emphasis that would help would be to talk more in the rule or in the committee notes about applying the rule only where it's truly misleading or unfair. And of course, a court could make that decision in a motion in limine or make the decision in the context where it's able to have a hearing of some kind in order to very thoughtfully make a choice about whether the remainder of statements should be allowed in. Another thing I think it would be important for the advisory committee to consider is the problem of 106, particularly in the criminal context. So to talk a little bit more about this trumping problem, if we put the detective on the stand, And the prosecution says, what did the defendant say? Answer. He said, I did it. That statement is admissible when offered by the prosecution as a statement of an opposing party under 801D2. But when the defense counsel stands up and says, what else did the defendant say? Now that statement is inadmissible because, of course, you can't use 801D2 in order to introduce your own statement. That becomes particularly problematic in the case of criminal defendants because they're left with this really unpalatable choice. They can either leave the jury with the impression that there was a full confession and nothing else, or they can waive their right to remain silent and choose to take the stand in order to correct the mistaken impression. Now, some courts have said, well, yes, that's motivation, but we're not compelling the defendant to take the stand. 
I would still argue that it's impacting at least those constitutional rights. And that should be something that a court should consider in deciding whether or not to allow the remainder of the statement to come in. And then finally, I think the advisory committee should look back at the issue of limiting instructions. The common law used those as a way of splitting the difference, just like we do when a statement, for example, is admissible for impeachment, but not for substance. We use those kinds of instructions all the time, and we expect that in most cases, jurors can follow those instructions. That's a way, I think, to deal with some of the concerns that surround expanding the rule of completeness. Yeah, I kind of feel like your third point there in many ways addresses your second. If you allow the use of the second part of the statement, but I did it in self-defense, for an explanatory purpose, then it would seem to me to avoid the hearsay problem and you don't really have the problem that you describe in the second part of your answer. Is that true? Although that gets us around the hearsay problem, it does become problematic in some cases. Let's go back to, I did it, but it was self-defense. The defendant in that case is trying to introduce, but it was self-defense, ideally in order to get a self-defense instruction, which might either result in the jury convicting him of a lesser included, or it might completely exculpate him for a particular crime. In order to get that particular instruction, the judge is going to have to decide that there's some substantive evidence that there really was self-defense. And if all we have is a remainder of the statement and an instruction to the jury that they can use it for completion, but not for substantive evidence, it might undermine the defendant's argument that he's entitled to that particular self-defense instruction. Final question for you. What's next for you? Are there future directions that you are taking this work on Rule 106, or are you pursuing other issues? So the two big projects that I'm working on right now are both books, and they are both about criminal procedure rather than about evidence. So I have a book coming out probably this summer, on Miranda versus Arizona. That's with a co-author, Amos Giora, who's also a professor at the University of Utah. And then I'm in the process of writing a book, again with Professor Giora, about a case called Arizona versus Youngblood, which evidence professors might not be aware of, but criminal procedure professors would be. It's about whether the destruction of potentially exculpatory evidence represents a due process violation. And although the topic might seem a little bit dry, the case itself is extremely interesting. It went up to the Supreme Court. The court found that it was not a violation of due process. And then years later, the Innocence Project took up the case. And it turned out that the defendant in the case actually had not committed the crime. So it's a very difficult case for defendants. And yet it rests on the shoulders of an innocent defendant. And an interesting issue that is not normally talked about in evidence class, but spoliation of evidence is about proof and about evidence issues. Absolutely. Well, Louisa, thanks for taking the time to talk about Rule 106 and the Rule of Completeness. Great having you on the show. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here. It seems rather odd to me whenever the common law resurfaces in evidence law. Whether you like them or not, The whole point of the federal rules was to occupy the space and to provide notice, a coherent scheme, and uniformity. The federal rules really do have an elegant and compact underlying structure, and whenever a court or Congress tries to add bells and whistles, it usually has unintended effects. But I suppose some courts find irresistible the urge to develop side doctrines or feel a nostalgia for former times. To me, the most interesting issue is the one over admissibility, what Louisa called the trumping function. As we explored in the interview, even without 106, at least for the purpose of explanation or distortion correction, the issue isn't really a hard call. Using the completing material to explain the statement isn't using it for its substantive truth so you evade the hearsay prohibition altogether. 
Yes, that somewhat slices the baloney thin, but we have a long history of doing this in evidence law. And in a sense, it's too bad for the opponent. If the opponent chooses to create a distortion, then there will be high probative value in correcting it. So the previously inadmissible and hidden evidence now gets an airing before the jury. What I had to think about more was why Rule 106 should make the completing statement substantively admissible. Suppose the prosecution offers half the defendant's statement. I did it under Rule 801 D2A. Why should the defendant now be entitled to admit the completion, but I did it in self-defense, for its substantive truth? Ultimately, I think the answer may boil down to estoppel. Fairness dictates that the prosecution may either admit the full complete statement or not at all. So if it offered I did it under 801 D2A, it must also offer the completion, but I did it in self-defense under 801 D2A as well. Now, as a matter of form, because the defense is offering the statement but I did it in self-defense under Rule 106, it technically creates an admissibility problem because the defense, of course, can't offer the hearsay statement under 801 D2A. But functionally, we can think of it as if the prosecution already offered the completion when it gave the first half of the statement. So yes, Rule 106 formally creates admissibility, but not really. Finally, it seems to me that Rule 106 is one of those technical evidentiary areas where the advisory committee could do a lot of good. Regardless of what rule is chosen, no one side, prosecution or defense, or plaintiff or defense, no one side is particularly advantaged. The question instead is about administrability and accurate decision-making. But whatever the rules are, they should be settled without uncertainty, and without it depending on what court you happen to be in. Support for Excited Utterance is generously provided by Vanderbilt Law School's Brandstetter Litigation and Dispute Resolution Program and the University of Arkansas School of Law. The associate producer is Alex Nunn, and the production editor is Grace DiPietro. Additional production assistance is provided by Francesca Rutherford, and music is provided by the Vanderbilt University Blair School of Music's Children's Cello Choir under the direction of Kirsten Castle Greer. Thanks also to the Faculty of Law at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem, who hosted me during the recording of this episode. I'm your host, Ed Chang, and I hope you will join me again next time when we take on another new work in the world of evidence and proof. Thank you.